A reading from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests, and the people added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while seventy years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord. Zion, among the aspects of that land, we hope. 
St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for you. It is a gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe 
has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, one of the worst things that can happen to any religion is to get disconnected from life and become a separate, specialized category of its own. Such an occurrence, unfortunately, is not at all uncommon. Most religions, it seems, have a tendency to become preoccupied with themselves and lost interest in the everyday lives of the people whom they claim to serve. Such was the sad situation of the first century Judaism with which Jesus had to deal. It had taken the moral and ethical message of the prophets and reduced it to a system of strict doctrines and little rules that had virtually no relations to the hopes and fears and needs of the people. This was the reason that Jesus parted company with the scribes and Pharisees. He would have nothing to do with a religion that had nothing to do with life. Looking back across the centuries, we can see the good sense of that. What is the use of religion if all it does is live in a little world of its own? We applaud the down-to-earth convictions of our Lord and would like to believe that our position is somewhat the same as his. But there we apply this test of practicality to our own faith. Could it be that our religion has the same tendency to lose its relatedness to life? A good place to start asking that question is in our use of the word salvation. What does the word mean to you? It is one of the most prominent words in our Christian faith. We preach about it, we sing about it, we pray for it. But what does it mean? We, when we speak of Christ as our Savior, what have we got in mind? In what sense does he save us? Let me to provide the answer to my own question. I fear that for most people, the word salvation applies primarily to what happens to us after we die. To say that Christ saves us means that we end up in heaven instead of hell. With that kind of thinking, we discover the saving work of Christ from this life and postpone it until the next. It is the same tendency that we mentioned a few moments ago. To disconnect religion from daily living, and make it a little category unto itself. We have no right to do that. Anyone in the right state of mind hopes to eventually end up in heaven. But for that moment, it is not our most pressing problem. We need to be saved right now. Today's Gospel reading deals with this great theme of salvation and almost the entire passage is written in the present tense. It begins with an illustration from the wilderness, wanderings of the children of Israel. They were on their way to the promised land. But along the way, there were problems, one of which was snakes. They were, they were being bitten, and many of them were dying. 
according to the story. God told Moses to make a snake of brass and mount it on a pole in the midst of the camp. Then those who were bitten could look to the bronze serpent and be healed. Salvation took place then and there, not, not later in the promised land. Jesus applied the, that illustration to his own ministry, saying, So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believes may have eternal life in him. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, why should we take the message of salvation and postpone it until heaven? It is good to know there is a promised land out there, but what we need is a snake bite remedy that works right here in the wilderness of life. I am going to mention three very practical ways that you and I need to be saved right now. First, we need to be saved from the smallness of a self-centered world. Every one of us entered this life as a tiny bundle of selfishness. Babies are like that. As far as they are concerned, the world resolves around them. They care about nothing or no one but their own needs and desires. When they are hungry, they want to be fed right then. It doesn't matter to them whether anyone else eats or not. The only thing that counts is the satisfying of their hunger. It is the same way when they are thirsty or tired or sick. If a baby gets sick, everyone, everyone else in the house could be burning with a fever, and it would make no difference to him. With a loud voice, he will demand that someone come and make him feel better right now. Such behavior, of course, is normal for a child. So we accept it, work with it, and wait for them to grow out of it. The tragedy is that some of them never do. All of their lives, they live in that same little self-centered world, where the only thing that counts is the, meet, is the meeting of their personal needs and desires. If you have ever been around or dealt with such a person, you know how tragic that can be. And I am not speaking now of someone whose mental development is arrested early in life. We feel the same understanding for that person as we would for a child. I am speaking of the man or woman whose soul never grows. They never discover the rest of the human race. They never learn that there are other needs, just as urgent as even more than their own. They never packed up and moved out of their childish world into the adult world, where other people count just as much as they do. Well, let's get honest. I have been speaking in the third person, talking to you about them. But in truth, we are really talking about ourselves. To some extent, we all live in a self-centered world. A degree of that is necessary. We cannot serve others unless we give some attention to caring for ourselves. But that is not what most of us are doing, taking care of ourselves in order to be of service. What we are doing is looking out for number one. We have expanded our world a little bit, but it is still too small. When we and our families are fed, we tend to forget those who are starving. When, when we and our families are healthy, we forget those people who are sick and have no access to medical care. What we need is a saving relationship with Christ that can save us from such smallness and make us citizens of the world. The only hope for the human family is for enough of us to start caring about the rest of us. And I don't know anyone who can give us that kind of compassion 
except the one who died for all of us. The next thing we need to be saved from is the fear of, of an uncertain world. Let's face it, these are frightening times. Our lives seem to be at the mercy of circumstances and events that are beyond our control. Someone whom you don't even know makes a decision and suddenly you are out of a job. It happened to others. It could happen to you. In other country, some angry person plants a bomb that explodes and kills innocent bystanders. We watch that kind of thing and wonder how long it will be before the same frustration breaks out here. Interest rates are so high that few people can buy a house. And it is increasingly difficult to afford an apartment. Many are wondering when it will change and how they can hang on until it does. Well, how are we to lead stable lives in the midst of all this uncertainty? I only know one answer, and that is faith in God. Jesus also lived in a dangerous world. His life was in constant danger at the, at the hands of anger and un, unprincipled men. But he believed that God was with him, and that was good enough. With that kind of faith, he held a steady course in a stormy sea. You and I need a saving relationship with him that will enable us to share that same faith. Finally, we need to be safe from the cynicism of, of a hopeless world. Bertrand Russell used to advise his students to build their lives on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Such, I suppose, is the only logical conclusion for one who does not believe in God. If there is no God, then ultimately there is no hope. Nothing is left but despair, and the best we can do is keep a stiff upper lip and refuse to cave in. Surely, there must be a better way. I, for one, don't want to become cynical about life cynical about people, cynical about myself. And it is Christ who convinces me that this is possible. If ever there was a man who had legitimate cause to become cynical, it was Jesus. Be but he never did. His way of life was rejected, but he believed it would ultimately succeed. His friends denied him and betrayed but still he trusted them. On the cross, he felt forsaken by God, but he trusted his spirit to divine keeping and rose from the grave. Many in our world today are stuck in cynicism. We do not have to join their ranks. Available to us is a saving relationship with the ho hopeful Christ, that can lift us above it and keep, our, and keep our spirits floating. My dear brothers and sisters, salvation is not just a question of heaven or hell. It is a matter of here and now. Only one life to live. We need not live it in selfishness, fear and cynicism. Christ has come that the world might be saved through him that salvation can be ours today.